you're here for a real treat. So thank you for all coming out. My name is Ann Helmreich, and I'm the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities. And on behalf of my colleagues at the Center and the College of Arts and Science at Case Western Reserve University, I welcome you to our event this evening. Um, through the generosity of the camp and family, the Baker Nord Center is able to present to our community a lecture devoted to architecture. And I want to thank the camp and family for their support, and there are several members of the family who could be with us tonight, so thank you very much. And I also want to acknowledge one of our past speakers, Bob Madison, who I just saw a minute ago, so thank you, thank you. And in fact, there's a number of alumni of our architecture program in the audience tonight, so can we take a moment to thank all these people who support architecture in our community. Tonight's speaker is Doug Farr, an um, urban planner and president and CEO of Farr Associates Architecture and Urban Design. Doug Farr has earned his reputation through his ecologically sensitive, sustainable urban constructions. His Chicago-based and award-winning architecture and planning firm has recently been named by the New York Times the most prominent of the city's growing cadre of ecologically sensitive architects. Farr Associates was the first firm to design three buildings certified as platinum, the highest distinction under the leadership in energy and environmental design, LEED. Currently, the firm has completed its fourth platinum building, and the fifth and sixth are in the works. Farr's work has been featured in Architectural Record, The New York Times, The Chicago Tribune, and the PBS documentary, The Green Machine. In his highly acclaimed book, Sustainable Urbanism, Urban Design with Nature, Far and contributing authors introduce models for sustainable urban design that pay equal attention to urban planning and architectural design. And in fact, sustainable urbanism will be for um, sale following the lecture, and Doug Farr will be available to sign copies, and you'll find that at the top of the stairs here. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I may be at the head of the line, but if you beg me, I'll, I'll go to the end. Um, time permits me to highlight only a few of Doug Farr's accomplishments, but you can see why we were delighted that he accepted our invitation to speak as part of our theme this year, Cultures of Green, Nature and the Environment, and to contribute to our campus's continuing exploration of sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Doug Farr. I'm delighted to be in Cleveland, delighted. No place I'd rather be tonight. So who are you? You've heard about me, who are you? Who's an architect? Who is a graduate of Case Western Reserve Architecture School? Right, right, great, welcome back. Uh, who's a planner? City employee, a municipal employee, elected official. Mayor, I guess it's not you, you're the only one. So there's no governors in the, in the audience either, right? Um, who else do we have? Who are, who are you, artists, developers? It's, it's a rare profession right now, so you, you all know that. Uh, who else are you, who, who have I forgotten? Students? Okay, engineer, great, who else? That's it? So, okay, citizen who would like to ge in generate enthusiasm. Oh, great. How about voters? How about people that don't vote? Put your hand up really high, because we are coming after you. All right. All right, well, I'm delighted to be here. Um, a couple rules. Um, we're going to ask that the lights come down, because I have a PowerPoint. I want to, I believe in showing a lot of pictures. Uh, if you start snoring, I will throw something at you. So please don't do that. But um, I'm delighted to be here to talk, um, uh, first of all, to th thank the, the family that sponsored us tonight. It's just delightful. And uh, uh, a great family uh, in the second and third generation of interest in, in the topics of architecture and the humanities. What I want to talk about is um, sort of insights that I've learned. If we can put the lights down, that would be just wonderful. Insights I've learned, uh, you know, those of us who are trained as architects are trained to believe that uh, the, the answer is in the built work and uh, that ideally that the built work is a building, right? And as you can see, this, the title of tonight's talk, Sustainable Urbanism, the New American Dream, 
my thinking has evolved to believe that what our opportunity is of this generation and probably the generations to come is to, particularly in the United States, is to reposition the things we dream to want, the things that we aspire to have. And so that's a lot of what you're going to hear about uh, uh, tonight. So the new American dream, you see the picture here, not actually a picture uh, of the United States. Scary picture to some people. I'm sorry to do this to you. Um, uh, but uh, I'd like to start with this to say that um, uh, Richard Nixon is, is still today, I believe, our country's most environmental president. What gives me the cause to say this? Um, he enacted the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, NEPA, uh, created the Environmental Protection Agency, all, all under Nixon. Uh, now, they were all reactive. They were all after the fact. They were all in response to a problem that, that we had created and now we're trying to sort of clean up. But to this day, including Clinton and Obama and Carter and, and others of the Bush one, uh, you know, he is it. And so the thought that the federal government is somehow going to be a heavy hand and going to come in and wave a wand and make our world a great place to live is, is not true in this country. And so what I believe is, uh, what Nixon would have said had he been asked, that all sustainability is local, which is to say the work of people in this room, and it was actually great to kind of hear you know, the diversity of people's uh, daily lives and, and work, uh, is that we in this audience are, are the sort of protagonists. We're the actors in this next generation of change. And the young woman here who said, I'm here to get my neighbor, myself and my neighbors excited about making things better, that's absolutely what I think sustainability uh, is is about. It is, it is local. And so Cleveland has the same story. Now, w another sort of perspective I've gained over the years is this idea of sustainability, which if you haven't heard it, it's a buzzword out there, but it's, it was actually defined uh, by the Brundtland Commission in the 80s as being essentially meeting our current needs without burdening future generations. And that's fair. That it really is fair that our children and our grandchildren shouldn't pay for things that we, uh, we, we do. So, but I, what I find is, and this is where I want you to sort of expand your mind. So, you know, check at the door, whatever training you had or what specialty you had, and think broadly. And, and, and I think you'll get a lot more out of the talk. But that every one of us, myself included, approaches sustainability from some narrow uh, silo of some sort. And that this prevents us from actually getting to great outcomes. And so, for example, I believe that if you read the papers, you can see discern this pattern, which is to say, uh, if when when people report about and talk about sustainability, this trinity often appears: the light bulb, the Prius, and the green building. And if only, uh, if only the devices of of everyday life, these three objects, were more efficient in their consumption of energy, we would have solved it. Right? Don't change how I how I go about my life or how I organize my. My, uh, my stuff, just make it all more efficient and let me do what I've always done. And that is essentially the, the, the dominant way that journalism reports on, on this sort of stuff. Now there are ironies with all of this. One, one is that as cars become more efficient, we drive them more miles because it is rational to do so. It's cheaper per mile. And so with a Prius, actually people could leave, have a longer commute for the same money, for example. And that's not the intended outcome. So efficiency uh, alone won't get us there. Of these three things tonight, I'm only going to, the smallest scale I'm going to talk about is the standalone building. So, and this, this is a picture, by the way, of our first, Far Associates' first zero net energy house, uh, designed actually by a Cleveland native, my, my colleague and partner, Jonathan uh, Boyer, has designed this uh, zero net energy house, the first in the Midwest. Now, I want to talk about culture, and this is, this is an interesting story. On November 6th, two days after the Obama uh, election on, on that Tuesday, this was a story on NPR. And this gentleman, I'm sure a very nice man, Sean Durkin, built himself a 4,000 square foot house. What was the story about? Well, after Sean had built himself a 4,000 square foot house, he found he couldn't afford uh, any sort of renewable energy systems. We'd love to have this panels, uh, something tacked on after the fact, if we could afford it. Now this story, uh, this is a laugh line, by the way, um, because Sean built himself a 4,000 square foot house and then couldn't afford solar panels. <laughs> Sean, we need to have a talk, right? So, you know, if Sean had built himself a 30 
800 square foot house, he would have had solar panels. If he had built a 3,400 square foot house, he would have had photovoltaic panels. A 3,200 square foot house, and he would have had uh, geothermal systems. And you, you get, the, get the idea that there's a trade-off between size and quality. And quality, in this case, the measure I'm using, is one of sustainability. So the house that I showed you, the zero net energy house, costs more. But if you, if you can afford the bigger house, you can afford a smaller house that, that does all these right things. And so this is the change of culture, the Walmart culture that we have in the United States, which is we will drive 10 miles to save, uh, to buy the $1.79 gallon of milk, which is the American way. It's cheaper there. I, you're not paying more, are you? You're an idiot, right? So, but you know, when it comes to houses and architecture, uh, there is a lot of sort of coupon clipping that goes on in the country. So, so here's LEED. Um, it's a powerful um, tool, right? Uh, and many people have heard about it. I can't see if you, if I were to ask for uh, a LEED, a show of LEED accredited professionals, I'm sure. Shout it out. If you're a LEED AP, who are you? Woo, 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 okay, a few of you, okay, very good. So uh, in the mid-90s, uh, a very powerful, influential movement that has really sh reshaped, I think, the architecture profession, everyone would agree. Uh, if you don't have a lead accredited professional uh, sort of initials on your card, you're considered sort of ho-hum or you're not competitive or you're not paying attention. There are now 135,000 lead accredited professionals, which fills the largest stadium uh, we have in this country and I think uh, in the world. But anyway, a term that was coined in 1996, hold that thought, so it's now 13 years old, which is half a generation. Uh, and it shows you, at the same time, I should say 135,000 lead accredited professionals, total number of certified buildings in the world, about 3,000. Now there's, you know, 100 million buildings in the United States, so we've got 3,000 are green. So in half a generation, 3,000 out of 100 million are green buildings. So we obviously we're not going to quite get there that way. Now get to where we need to go by doing it one building at a time. And then there are problems with green buildings. So look at this. What you have here is a building, the uh, image of the building, this is maybe offensive to some of the architects in the room, but the image of the building has actually been perped out. Why would I do this? This is a lead platinum building, right? So this is the best green building that we can think of, right? It, it does all sorts of amazing things. But look at where it's located. Oh my lord. So this is, this is a land use that I often describe as mixed. Be mixed land use. What do I mean? Uh, there's asphalt paving to the top and concrete paving to the bottom. So it's mixed. It's diverse, right? And then you see on the right hand side is uh, what is called a Houston Highway. Now Houston Highway is a highway where if you see a pedestrian it's because their car broke down. Right? So here's the ability to deliver a green building, an object in isolation within the property lines, virtuous, wonderful, saves energy, saves water. Uh, you can eat the walls if you need to. It's that sort of healthy, right? But look at what it's doing in terms of building a place. If anything, it's hostile to all that sort of stuff. So the building, the green building agenda, lead as virtuous as it is, is a silo. And this is, it's half right and it's half wrong. And I debate whether it's a better thing that this have been a lead platinum building or the project not have gone forward at all. And I think the latter is preferred. So here's another one. We had an intern, back, remember the, when the economy was good? What was that, 07, 08? So we had an intern that summer uh, that we paid to do some research for us. And one of them was to ask the question of the green buildings, uh, 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 one of the most popular areas is green schools, right? So we had this intern do this research on what, what to uh, uh, take 10 sample green schools and ask this basic question, which is, what was the nature of the school project? Was it a school from scratch? Was it a replacement school? Uh, all those sorts of things. And what we found was three of the 10 schools seemed to fit this description. Um, first of all, I can't see your hands, but how many people grew up walking to school? So, and then how many, how many did not? And I think you'll see, I can't see you, but if, you know, this exercise in the past is the young people didn't walk and the older people did, right? So we've had a generational shift there where two generations ago, 75% of kids walked to school and now it's about 20%, right? And there's, there's issues with that. But so what we had here in three of the 10 sample school cases was the phenomenon where uh, this, is, this was an existing school in a little town called West Brazos, Texas. And it was a neighborhood school no parking lot, all the kids walk to school. 
what happened? The school, school board got this idea they needed a new, bigger school. Why? There were two schools a little ways away and they were paying a lot of money for their cafeteria service because they had two cafeterias. So they decided to consolidate them. Where did the school go? Out on the highway, three miles outside of town. When you read about the new, LEED certified green school, one of the great features of it was the, the stormwater system that captured, filtered, and recharged into the ground all of the stormwater runoff off the huge parking lot of this green school, right? So before all the kids walked to school, and maybe it was an older school and didn't have as much insulation or quality of windows that we have today, but it was part of a community. It was a building block of a walkable system, if you will. The new green school was oblivious to all of this and destroyed it all. And so, again, here's a green building. It probably got a very nice plaque on it. But I would submit to you that it was better, that the community is a net, it's worse off for having this new green building, right? It's better that this project never have happened, right? Yet we, cl we clamp on the side of it uh, our, our, green, our green plaque. And then there's laugh slides like this. <clears throat> so <laughs> could this be a green building? Absolutely. Could, what would the lead system ask of this picture? It would ask, are the escalators efficient? Not are they absurd and a bad idea. It would ask, you know, are the escalators made of recycled stainless steel? Uh, and rather than asking, do we need the escalators at all, right? So you could certify this presumably at LEED Platinum if you, if you chose to. Nowhere along the way does the question come up and say, do we actually need this? Is this a good idea? And isn't, you know, what's what the tubby guy that's taking the escalator to his health club, you know, what's with that, right? So nobody asked that question. So again, lead is a tool. It gets us a distance, uh, but it ain't in, in and of itself without sort of critical thinking isn't the answer. Now, Probably in my world, the issues, you know, I'm trained as an architect twice and then function as an architect and planner, but the issue that probably green buildings uh, are not engaged in yet as much uh, is the one of sort of physical activity. And so uh, I want to sort of shock you, this, uh, these are interesting images, but these are images provided to any of you on the Centers for Disease Control website. If you Google in obesity maps, you'll get these. So here's the country, and you can see it's 1988, so this is essentially 20, 21 years ago, and you can see the little uh, thing in the, in the bottom. The uh, a lot of states, there's no obesity data, and then the two categories are 10%, uh, and then between 10 and 14% obesity. And you can see there's how we do in Ohio, we're in the 10 to 14% obesity in 1988. Fast forward 10 years. So the, the chart has grown to include two more categories. And so Ohio has moved up one notch to the 15 to 19% obese category, as has most of the country. This is, this is in our lifetimes, everyone here uh, uh, and uh, uh, in the last little bit. So fast forward 10 more years. And you see the country. And so you can see we've added two more categories. Uh, again, uh, Ohio has sort of tracked, as it does in presidential elections, tracked the nation, right? And uh, there you go. So the nation went brown. Ohio led the way uh, going brown, which is 25 to 29% obese. This is a bad trend, right? As we are about to adopt national health care, we collectively will pay for this trend, which is a very expensive trend and manifests itself in the form of type 2 diabetes and, and other uh, non-directly called obesity issues. Um, anyway, so it's, it's, this is the worst public health uh, uh, epidemic, I am told, sort of the fastest growing thing. And, and it particularly is painful when it applies to children, which is where, where it's going. And I submit to you, this is how we've laid out our country and our cities and our daily lives to live there, work there, uh, recreate there, and connect them all with car trips. Something that wasn't true a generation ago and certainly not two generations ago. And that this is one of the opportunities going forward, and I think especially for Cleveland. Uh, so uh, one of the statistics that also goes with that is, is, is this one. This is a chart uh, that shows where uh, Californian, 11-year-old 11 English-speaking Californians, why that, I don't know, but where they spend their time. And you can see 85% of a California 
a kid's time is spent indoors. And another 4% is spent in what they call enclosed transit, which is, you know, bus, plane, train, uh, automobile. So 89% of their time is indoors. Now, this is not Alaska. This is not the desert. This is California. This is the land of, you know, milk and honey. This is where you go to recreate and be, you know, happy and fun and outdoorsy, right? So, you know, think about Minnesota, think about North Dakota, you know, so that we are an indoor species is what this says and the architects of the world have made it very comfortable for us with, you know, to our to our success, I mean, we've made being indoors very comfortable, so much so that we virtually choose not to leave it. So uh, one consequence of this, the average American by the age 25 has spent one year in a car. One year. And I will dare say most of that year the car was running. Right? So we didn't have Priuses that if the car was idle half the year, six months of it, it was running on batteries or not running at all. So anyway, this is the sort of snapshot state of our, of our country. Um, and it, this is the, I think, the last of my, quote, downer slides. So it'll, it'll, it'll pass in just a minute. Size does matter. But um, with it is this statistic that, um, you know, we may, we are likely to be the first generation where our children will have shorter lifespans than the parents. And it's these lifestyle issues of obesity, inactivity, and with these sort of, you know, pretty alarming statistics. Architects are trained and state licensed to deliver uh, on life safety, to make sure that people's lives are not endangered in the things they design. And so this is not something that has traditionally been the domain of architects, but I submit to you it needs to be. So that's pretty exciting. So anyway, FAR Associates, we have a mission to, to design sustainable human environments. So we're for-profit, mission-driven, all that sort of stuff. And we practice in these four areas of master, master planning and urban design, form-based coding, which is a cool thing you'll see some pictures on in a minute, high-performance architecture, and we really, for all of my running down of the deficiencies of LEED, uh, we totally embrace LEED in every project we do. We aspire to do LEED or another new rating system called the Living Building Challenge. So we're um, critical but completely uh, uh, embedded, just love it, and then historic preservation. So. Here's what I want to share is my aha moment, kind of as an architect, I'll, you'll, you'll, this will be pretty obvious. So in 1998, we got a, a, a commission to do this, uh, what's called the Transit Oriented Development Plan. In Chicago, we have the L, you've heard of EL is short for elevated, and this is on the west side. It was a, a little neighborhood plan uh, at the intersection of Lake and Pulaski. And we were a little firm, in hindsight, we were a little firm then, kind of a startup, and you can see we weren't making a lot of money because we seem to only have two pencils, um, drab green and drab brown. And so you almost can't distinguish. But what you're seeing here is in the foreground is, is, an L, is the L train. And then you see kind of a, a U shape of buildings organized around a park. And if you can't actually see those things because the drawing's not that good, play along like you do. So, but anyway, so there you have it. And the premise here is that what, what we have in Chicago, and I think Cleveland has this in, in many parts, uh, like Shaker Square, is a little spot where the train stops and there's always been where, where there's a mode of transportation starting or stopping, or you get off a boat and get on a train, or transfer trains, that's where commerce happens. That's why cities are often founded uh, at the crossing of two railroads or the, the thin patch of a river, things like that. So we are designing this. And so we thought of this as a really sustainable project. What was sustainable about it? It was bringing um, economic activity to an inner, a kind of an overlooked inner city neighborhood in Chicago. It was providing goods and services to a, a depopulated neighborhood that hadn't had them in a long time, sort of shopping, uh, restaurant, uh, dry cleaners, daycare center, things like this. Uh, uh, it was providing a walk, a place to walk, a secure place to walk. It was providing transit ridership. All these things we thought, it was a brownfield, meaning a contaminated uh, site. So we thought this whole list of things, this is incredibly sustainable. We're really excited about it. The next year, 1999, 10 years ago, we got our first uh, lead uh, commission. This was a project uh, uh, championed by uh, our mayor for life, Mayor Richard M. Daly, uh, who said, uh, you know, we wanted we want to get into this green thing, and and authorized a project to take an existing building, pictured on the left here, uh, a former office building for the Kraft Foods uh, Company, and to convert it into the city's, uh, uh, indeed the region's, uh, uh, first lead platinum building. And when the mayor says you can do it if you if you 
deliver platinum, we were quaking in our boots the whole time because we really didn't know what we were doing. Uh, it was the world's third platinum when it was done. But again, we thought of this as an incredibly sustainable project, and it had all the, the virtues and, and attributes of a LEED certified building. Energy efficiency, water efficiency, recycled and local content materials, high indoor environmental quality. We policed out all the toxins from the glues, adhesives, and sealants, things like that. And, uh, 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 and then it was in a, an existing site, uh, transit served site. And so we thought this was an incredibly sustainable project. Other things that we sort of really kind of drilled down in this project were the, was the idea of integrated design. Integrated design is the simple idea that you have components of a building all of which do more than one job. So for example, in the picture on the left, we have a solar photovoltaic solar panels mounted above the south windows, south facing windows in this building, and they do double duty, maybe triple duty. They uh, generate electricity. They are mounted at an angle such that uh, in, this, in the wintertime when we, are, we would welcome direct sun penetrations in the window, the angles allow that in the summer when we want to shed heat. Uh, it's designed that way. It also keeps water off the steel lintel at the top of the window and I think uh, uh, lengthens the life cycle of that facade. So there's, there's an example of integrated design, a component doing multiple things. Also on the left image, we use geothermal heating and cooling, which is where you put uh, wells either deep into the ground or laterally, horizontally, and you use the ambient uh, 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 52 degree temperature of the earth to either extract or reject heat. And we found, thanks to talking to our engineer, that um, uh, if you do that in saturated soils, the efficiency of heat transfer goes up quite a lot. So not only is this our retention pond, detention pond, uh, it is also our, essentially our heating and cooling system. So integrated design on the left, new terms on the right. So you may have grown up calling that thing on the right hand side a ditch. It's a bioswale. So, uh, you know, you can impress your friends, impress your neighbors, the lady that wanted to get her neighbors excited about stuff, teach them about bioswale. So uh, bioswale isn't technically a ditch, but you know, new nomenclature gets us all uh, feeling like we're in the in club. So that, but we thought of that as a highly sustainable project. And the aha moment was to realize there was no overlap in the agendas or the achievements of these two really sustainable projects. And so uh, we made money at CCGT, so we bought some markers and we re-rendered the first drawing. And so you can actually see what, you know, what's a park and what's a building and things like that. So here you have it, it's that same U of buildings, but we've rethought it, rethought it. First of all, every building here is of course a green building in the manner of CCGT. Everything that isn't a green roof is a solar panel. Everything that isn't, is, isn't a solar panel is a white cool roof, et cetera, et cetera. So the buildings are, you know, events are arguably festooned with evidence that they're green buildings. Now what the sort of bigger rethinking, and this is my aha moment, is in the park. So as I mentioned at CCGT, our sort of open space, our detention basin, was also our heating system. So what we're proposing here is that this park, this sort of commons, be a park that was what we called a stormwater park. And by that we thought we could catch all the excess stormwater, rainwater, off the streets and any overflow off the buildings, direct it to the park and recharge the groundwater there. And at the same time, make underneath the park a district geothermal system, which would be the, the common heating and cooling system system for all the buildings uh, encircling the park. And so uh, here it was, in a nutshell, the invention of this term, uh, sustainable urbanism. And, uh, and so what you can see here are, are, it's a walkable place, right? It's served by transit, that's the L line. And then there's green buildings, high performance buildings all around it. And then a new term that we coined called high performance infrastructure, okay? And so low performance infrastructure is the sewer pipe or the stormwater pipe that conveys rainwater off your street, pollutes it, discharges it into a river and considers it progress. That's infrastructure, but it's low performing. High performing is the stormwater park that filters the water and reintroduces a natural hydrologic pattern, for example, right? So, so we, there we were, we we're really excited about this. So we, th we thought that this integration of all these things was really gonna take, take the world by storm. We went through some false steps, but we knew we had sort of hit on pay dirt when we got a commission from the town of Normal 
Illinois. When your town is called normal, you have to try a lot harder, right? Um, same with Peoria and in places, uh, you know, maybe my hometown of Detroit. Um, but anyway, normal completely went for it. And so we proposed, not surprisingly, a stormwater, uh, in this case, circle. So it was a new downtown plan, 10 acres, and uh, what is now a quarter billion dollars of uh, either built or projected construction. So Normal bought the program and also became, in 2002, the first municipality in the US <clears throat> Cleveland, the first municipality in the U.S. to require private sector buildings to be LEED certified. So Normal was ahead of, let's make the list, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Boston, Austin, Boulder. So Normal Illinois brought distinction on itself by leadership. So I think leadership is one of the things I want to cultivate. So here is at the ground level, how does this sort of circular street, circular intersection, circular plaza work? The premise is that we catch water off the streets when it's available. On the dry days, there happens to be a stormwater pipe going underneath the site. So we grab that and filter that in a double helix. So you can see there's a kind of a treatment train that goes once around the outside and then a cleansed uh, what's to a what's called a bathable, touchable level uh, on the inside. So kids can play with the water that falls from the heavens. And so this idea that infrastructure, in this case high performing infrastructure, water that takes and cleanses water becomes the civic art, right? How many times have you seen the sort of awful um, excuse me, the steel sculpture that the town hates and that every year the graduating seniors spray paint their school color and then the municipal crews come out on Monday and roller paint back the right colors, you know, that's kind of the, the art you hate. So this is art, this is civic art and it's high performance infrastructure at the same time. So it delights in water, it's a joy to do and it puts water in a very unexpected place in an urban center. Now to deliver this town of normal rotunda, this sort of drum of a public space, we needed to invent a tool. Fortunately, or we didn't, others invented it. We appropriated this tool called form-based coding. And to the architects of the, in the room, this may seem like an infringement on one's freedom as an artist to sculpt as they see fit on a given building site. But in this case, what we were after is to create that sort of drum, that rotunda of space. And so the, essentially, you can think of this as sort of a cake mold to say, uh, build it as tall as you want, use a variety of materials, whatever you want, but as, as to the surfaces, it needs to touch all these surfaces. So we're trying to avoid setbacks and things like that. We want the building sort of tight to the street. So form-based code, you'll hear more about that uh, later. The first building was the locally designed by a, 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 an architect under the code was the Children's Museum. So here it is, um, you know, lots of features and so on. The punchline, though, is that all of this integration of all these things together broke so many rules, rules of rules about which I now need to tell two jokes. How many architects does it take to change a light bulb? Does it have to be a light bulb? <laughs> How many engineers does it take to change a light bulb? Change? What's, what's change? So this was the issue. The idea of a circular intersection was, would, caused a brain scan meltdown. There wasn't anything in the book, that the cookbook, that you pull off the shelf and approve by standards to do that. Well, you know, we could all cite a number of them, including arguably a couple places uh, in, in and around Cleveland that were essentially circular intersections, but the engineers could not fathom what this was. And the thought of actually having people in the center of this intersection, that, was ver that broke every rule in the book, right? And then the thought of having water next to the people in the, in the middle of the intersection, we were you know, a mortal sinner at this point. So uh, add two years to the approvals process because the, the, uh, that kind of joke about you know, change, uh, we, were, we were up against it. So we were, were really pushing the limits on buildings and civil engineering and how these things all integrate together. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, this is about a year old picture. It's quite, quite far along now, very exciting. So here's sustainable urbanism, which is you know, what the book is about and what I submit to you is the thing that I actually think we could get pretty excited about as a society and, and in each individual community, the thing that we might aspire to do. Walkable transit served urbanism integrated with high performance buildings and high performance infrastructure. So what's, what's, what's the operative word here? It's the word integrated with, right? That these things are interdependent, right? They, they rely on one another to function. And this is very much stolen from Europe. I mean, this is essentially the trend that Europe's on, uh, you know, 
many cities aspire to sort of look, have their bones that point to Europe, that, that the best places are, are uh, uh, urban in the way that Europe is and so on. In sustainability, the United States is between 15 and 20 years behind Europe. And so this is in some ways, you know, back to the future stuff to say this is the, tr the direction, the trend we want to go. And it especially makes sense when there's a master planned uh, development or redevelopment going on. So equipped with that sort of aha moment and this sort of armed with this definition, we sat down to write the book. And it was, it was a great uh, experience. It was a top selling planning book of 2008, which doesn't mean you really have to sell that many copies. I mean, planning books, you know, a bestseller is, you know, Michael Crichton here, planning bestseller here. But it's, it's a, it is a, is a very good selling book. So the, it has a thesis, and here it is in a nutshell, global domination by 2030. Let me swallow the microphone and say it again. Global domination by 2030. So the premise is that this is such a good idea, that this is so appealing uh, in terms of how we shape and reshape our existing and new communities. This is what we should all aspire to. And, you'll, and I've got a couple of case studies I hope gets you sort of excited uh, about that. I also come equipped with some advice. Um, and, I, and this is advice that I share uh, around the country uh, to communities uh, that say, you know, gee, I was really excited about that, but what do we do? And so here's, here's my advice. So you didn't ask for it, but I'm going to leave you with it. So step number one is initiate an aspirational development. And, and you'll hear about this in a minute. So this is an idea of like, take something and you say, let's not do it like we did it last year or 7% better than last year. Let's just, you know, aim, swing for the fences, aim for the stars, whatever metaphor you want to choose. So at the back of sustainable urbanism, which will be for sale after the lecture, um, uh, there are case studies. And I want to talk about uh, two of them. But before I do, this idea of sustainable urbanism and the kind of nature, the nature of master planned projects, we thought, we asked the question, gee, is there a minimum size? Does it have to be big? And does this sort of prevent it from being actually that, that widely adopted? So the first, the answer was no. And what we found was these are drawings, planned drawings to scale of one, two, three, four, five, six projects that range as small as a quarter acre and as large as thousands of acres. So size, and unlike the prior slide, size in this case doesn't matter. But there are two I want to talk about. The first one is called Dockside Green, and it's in Victoria, British Columbia. The project is, I believe it's 15 acres. And uh, if, if I get it wrong, please correct me. So it's on, a, on the waterfront in one western corner of Canada. It's, uh, it's a brownfield site, meaning it's a contaminated site. Prior human activities there have uh, polluted the soil. Um, but it was an infill site. A developer stepped up and said, we will develop it sustainably. So you can read here all of the, all of the things that it does, you know, reductions in energy use and water use and uh, the creation of affordable housing. Uh, incidentally, virtually all of the systems here are district systems. So the idea that the, arch the architect designs one building at a time and each building has its own uh, boiler or its own chiller and so on. No, no, no. Europe and this project and I think the future is all about district systems because there's an incredible uh, uh, operating efficiency to, to doing that. But anyway, having said all that, I want to focus your attention on the top bullet. All 26 buildings in this project are lead platinum. Platinum. So this is about two, two, two what year was that? 2007, I think it was, when this, this, this was uh, proposed. It's now mostly built. And the developer pledged a $1 million bond, forfeitable bond, if all 26 buildings didn't achieve this very high level lead platinum, right? So can you imagine, who, who would like this project in Cleveland? First of all, show of hands. Pretty cool, right? right? So this is aspirational, by the way. So this is not lead certified or lead silver or 7% better. This is like way ahead, way ahead. And it forces a, re, a general rethinking in, uh, about how you deliver projects and what you, what, in fact, what your goals are. But when asked the developer, a gentleman named Joe Van Bellingham, how do, aren't you worried about your million dollars? And he said, absolutely not. We did this integrated design. We optimized systems, not components. And we're totally going to get the lead, lead things. At the time this was proposed, one 15-acre project in a corner of Canada, the world's supply of lead platinum buildings, there were 24 in the, in the, in the world, right? So one project 
a small, a tiny project really doubled them. This is, this is inspiring. Here's, here's also what it looks like in the center. Part of the larger sustainable, one, a common pattern, I should say, in the larger sustainable urbanist projects is that there's some sort of water feature. You saw it in the first drawing we did. You saw it in normal. Here it is in dockside green. And what is the water doing? It is doing double duty as it performs a stormwater uh, recharge and, and filtration function. It is also the polishing stage of the wastewater treatment system. So get this, check this out. So these are the townhouses. They face interior to the project, and they're the ones they charge the most money for. What do they face? The sewage treatment plan. So you have figured out your business really well, bidness, as my son likes to say, bidness, uh, really well if you can charge top dollar for facing a sewage plant. And so the technology is a different kind of technology. They have figured it out. So they've turned what is normally a negative. If you do any planning or look at a municipal plan, most city plans start with this. Here's the plant, here's the city, there's the river, the sewage plant goes on the river, and then industry surrounds the sewage plant because the technology was so bad, the odors perpetuate and no one will, you know, it's suppressed, the land values are suppressed. It's permanently affordable because no one wants to be there. This is the flip side, through design, through intentional design, the architects and the engineers created value in what is otherwise, around the world, a waste, waste stream and a waste product that suppresses real estate value. So brilliant, a brilliant rethinking. The second project I want to talk about is called BedZ. That was aspirational. This is even more aspirational if that's possible. So <clears throat> this is a project that is in uh, Beddington, England, which is outside of London, and it's a 4.08-acre site. So it's a tiny, tiny project. 82 dwelling units, 26,000 square feet of, of uh, office space. Um, and what the goal of this project is to achieve zero net carbon emissions and to uh, live within the constraints of what's called one ecological footprint. Now, if you haven't heard the term, an ecological footprint is actually a metaphor. It's not technically a measure. It's a metaphor that, for the idea that our lifestyles have a combined um, burden on the planet, right? So uh, that is to say, if you live, if we all lived collectively at, at the rate of one ecological footprint, we would require exactly the output of the Earth's resources and would be perfectly sustaining in perpetuity. If you require two planet, two ecological footprints, you need another Earth to supply all the resources and cleansing and food and nutrients to support your lifestyle. The American lifestyle seems to require four and a half planets. So the, the numbers, long-term numbers, don't look very good on that being <laughs> something we can keep up for a long time. So BEDZ set the right goal, which is to say, let's make a development that aspires to the flatline sustainable standard, one ecological footprint, right? And this is the resulting project. You can see also the other uh, 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 targets and so on. Uh, here's what it looks like. Now, this may not fit on your block. It w certainly wouldn't fit on my block, but, but what, it, what you have here is an absolute high level of integrated design. The architect here is a modernist, uh, uh, Bill Dunster, uh, one of the high-tech uh, practitioners in, in the UK, <coughs> excuse me. What you see are buildings. They're essentially attached row houses with south-facing solarium, and they have rooftop uh, photovoltaic panels. And then the sort of peacock-colored uh, uh, ventilators are devices that take the place of what we would do as mechanically produced cool air. So there's no air conditioning. They simply induce a ventilation through the units, and I, apparently that is possible in a somewhat more moderate uh, uh, heating, cool, excuse me, cooling climate uh, uh, than we have. But there it is. Bed Said. What was the construction cost premium compared to a conventional development for BEDZ? Guesses? What did it cost? 20% more, 30%? Double? Zero. Built for no premium through design. An architect that counted every stud and every nail and every mullion in the project and said, we would have spent this much we're going to design it smarter, and we're going to spend the same amount and get a much better outcome. And that's integrated design. How, how did they do this? Again, systems integration. The engineer, the mechanical engineer, was Ove Arup, which is 
uh, a, a world leader in these sorts of things and appears in a number of the case studies in the book, but here you have it. So here's a section through BedZ or one of the, one of the bars of BedZ. Uh, what rainwater falls on the roof is captured, used to flush toilets, finds its way into a greenhouse, grows things, etc. So nothing is, uh, nothing goes to waste. The photovoltaic panels, when they're not used by the residences during the day or the offices underneath them, are there to charge electric vehicles. So they were, again, about 10 years ahead of their time in anticipating what I think is about to be a hot trend and so on. So systems integration, everything is optimized. So one of the, one of the things that absolutely inspired me about this project is um, that the, pro the uh, client for this was a not-for-profit called Bioregional, and they, they're the people that have this mission to deliver one what they call one planet communities that live within one ecological footprint. And having set this goal of themselves, and in the, in the UK their ecological footprint nationally is a little lower than ours, so it's three and a half planets instead of four and a half, and so they, they measured how do we do, how do we do, and they got, they believe they got to 1.18 planets. Now, the, the precision I'm not sure is, is justified, but one simple way is they came close, right? They came close, three and a half to 1.18, which is great. So it's not, people are not shivering in the wilderness. They're not, you know, getting rained on and so on. This is, this is viable developed world stuff. But then they asked themselves, how do we get from three and a half to 1.18? And this is what they found. They do this assessment. You can see the categories. But basically what they found was this. 63% of the benefit or reduction of harm, however you care to describe it, came from the physical design, the bricks and mortar, the insulation, the solar panels, the shared walls, the plug-in electrics, and so on. 37% was changes of conduct. Changes in conduct. So people just did things differently, made, had different values, altered their patterns in, in how they lived. And so if you, if you want to round these things to rough numbers, two-thirds, it's, it's what the architect conventionally designs, and one-third, it's the induced change in conduct. And I submit to you, the architects in the world, in the room, <coughs> that going forward, our practices need to be responsible for both sides of this equation, the two-thirds and the one-third, to the designing in the conduct. So that's pretty exciting. Number two, step number two, this is for Cleveland, strengthen your existing neighborhoods and um, corridors. So first of all, um, have people heard of a website called WalkScore? Is that familiar to WalkScore.com? Go home, enter your address, see what you come up with. As a preview of this, I wanted to acquaint you with the tool and show you the walk assessments of three communities in uh, metropolitan Cleveland. One is downtown uh, Cleveland, which I think takes us right to uh, Terminal Tower or so. And it's on a 100-point scale, downtown Cleveland, 98 out of 100, very walkable. The second one I chose was Shaker Square, 92 very walkable. So these are places that we think of you would go and you would see people walking uh, and so on. And so those are, those are assets. Those are good places uh, that we should invest in. Um, we struggled to figure out what the third one ought to be. We picked a place called Avon Lake. I don't know where it is. I apologize. But it didn't do as well. It is 26 out of 100, auto-dependent. That is to say that if you wanted to live either car-free or uh, be a family that had three cars and goes to two or two cars goes to the one, Avon Lake is not the place for you, right? So anyway, we appreciate that across a region uh, there are these different kinds of places. And I submit to you that going forward we need virtually only very walkable places and that I'm not, I'm not sure what the plan should be for the auto-dependent places. Um, they, uh, I wouldn't choose them. I'm going to clip past that. Um, but here is a, pr here's a concept, a diagram for you to consider. The sustainable neighborhood. And what is it? It's a place designed so well people will willingly walk. And this may seem far-fetched in Cleveland, like people drive everywhere here. And I, I get this across the country. Doug, other places maybe, but not here, right? It's a universal, you know, or the, they'll also say, maybe in Portland, but everywhere else, no, right? So, but no, it's coming here. So this is, this is, uh, you know, requires a switch to be thrown in your minds to say that this is the thing to aspire to, 
you have places that already are like this and you can enhance and, and grow them. Now one of the things that the book is dedicated to was this idea that well, what, you know, what are the rules of thumb of making a walkable place? And so the middle section of the book is devoted to this thing called these rules of thumb, designers' rules of thumb about how the different human and natural systems work together. And I'm going to illustrate a couple of them. Um, I'm going to skip through that and just say that's a way of mapping um, different corridors and so on. Here are all the different standards in the book and I want to get to one in particular too. Neighborhood retail. A lot of people, who grew up with a corner store on your block? A few people and now the young people probably not. So uh, I had one, you know, two blocks down in Detroit and the, my sense going backwards is I've remapped my neighborhood. There was one corner store and in our case it was a family that lived above the store and when you'd ring, come in and ring the door, and I was always buying candy, my mom was always buying milk, right? So there are milk and bread. But the family would often be upstairs doing something. They would come down, you'd ring a bell, and they'd sell you something. And sometimes it was the adult, sometimes it was the kid. And this is two generations ago, or one and a half. So, but neighborhood retail. And that was a nice thing. It allows you to not have a car and get that quart of milk in the middle of the day or the, the diapers or, or whatever it was. Um, anyway, so the question that I would pose to an expert Bob Gibbs, who provided this in the book, is how many households do you need within walking distance to support a corner store in 2007 when the book was written, or 2009, uh, the numbers haven't changed. To support a little corner store pictured here on the top, you need a thousand houses today. A thousand houses. Well, guess what? If you apply this across uh, the neighborhoods in, in Toledo, excuse me, in uh, Cleveland, or Toledo, or Detroit, or frankly most of Chicago, we don't have enough density within that neighborhood unit to support those walk-to options. So we consequently, we don't have the walk-to option, we drive. And so, and here's the other sort of requirements. These are the rules of thumb. And so if you're a city planner, if you're a mayor, or if you want to strengthen your neighborhood, get your neighbors excited, we think that one of the great opportunities is to add density. And one of the best ways we've seen around the country to do this is to change one zoning code to permit this, what we call invisible density. These are coach houses. On the left, it's an actual garage with a unit above it. This could be a studio. It could be what's called, no offense, a granny flat. <laughs> Could be grandpa flat too, uh, but anyway, that these are ways that that on urban streets, you know, subject to design regulations, can be something that you can change the zoning. And if an individual family or homeowner wants to do this, you permit it, right? Um, and and these can offer housing choices, a lot of affordable housing, and so on, and add that needed density to begin to support those walk-to destinations. Now, another standard that I want to talk to you about. So that's a standard in the book. You know, how much you just look it up. Here's another one. So we did a master plan, a smart growth master plan for Toledo, Ohio. And the, it struck us that uh, the, the Maumee River is you know, down the middle and, and Lake Erie is on the right. I think you are familiar with this map more than I am. Uh, but one of the questions we had was, how about the parks in Toledo? Because they, they like Detroit and like, like Cleveland, have had a depopulation. And so there's a lot fewer people living there now than were there someday. So there's available land. So the question in, a, in any kind of plan or master plan is, could we make more parks as we're doing all this stuff? And where would they go? And so we did this map, and these the green areas are obviously are their existing parks. The white areas around them are those places in the city that are a five minute walk from the park. And then the sort of charcoal, the rest of the city, more than a five minute walk from the park. Now, what this tells you is there's a lot of Toledo, Ohio that really isn't served very well by parks. At the same time, the city has lost a lot of population and has a lot of vacant land. So these two things strike me as an opportunity. In the book, you know, we say, well, that's intuitive, that's sort of a neat idea, uh, but you know, what, how, how do we know that there's actual value behind this? So in the book, we cite this study. It's an MIT real estate school study that basically says this, if you are if you can read this at all, this is a chart that says the sales premium that people will pay for a house based on its proximity to a park. And, uh, you know, double blind study, regression analysis, the whole bit. Uh, but basically, if you are within 100 feet of a park, people will pay a 24% sales premium for that house. 300 feet, it drops to 15%, 600 feet, 5%. And at a quarter mile, no premium, right? No premium. So you look back at this map of Toledo. 
You say, how could you increase value in urban neighborhoods? Well, look at all the gray area that has no premium, right? So there's a real opportunity. This is, this is hard-nosed real estate uh, stuff. And so, you know, you can view this as a capitalist and say there's money to be made, or you could simply say that in a capitalist society, what we're willing to pay a premium for is a clear expression of things we value. And so clearly, access, walking access to open space is something we value quite a lot. And lots of cities, and I pro I'm sure that Toledo may be one of them, um, you know, probably has some opportunities to enhance it. So what I want to do now is just add to that list the light bulb, the Prius, the green building, the neighborhood, and something I'm going to skip over for time, the corridor, are the five things that we should be considering in this whole societal learning curve of what is sustainability. Now, growing up, my mom always said, if you have a lot of things to do, what you need to do is to make a list of them and start with the thing that takes the longest first. She said, Doug, you, you, you trick yourself. If you start with the little stuff, you'll never get to the big stuff. So as a society, We've absolutely obsessed on the little stuff. You know, it's light bulb, light bulb, light bulb, and not at all about these bigger issues. Guess what? We have to do them all eventually, and I want to refocus our opportunities to the right-hand side of this slide. And so reverse the priorities. Start with the big stuff and do those, the projects and the density and the urban restructuring with sustainable urbanist projects. You get, you get the deal. It's also worth saying that the federal government actually has done a, a number of things right. <clears throat> not that I was saying it was done wrong, but this is the stuff that they can do. The standard Edison A lamp is now, you know, outlawed in 2012. In three years, you just can't, won't be able to buy them here. So that that efficiency argument is ticking these things off our to-do list. Uh, the cafe standards going in 2016, <clears throat> but when will we get to the land use? And so that's in, in part what I want to talk to you about tonight. Number three, this is something that is fix the rules, which is uh, ask for the right things. This is a down market in real estate, and I, I don't mean to, I have no judgment about that, other than to say it is a strategic time if we look at what we can do <clears throat> to fix our rules. Rules, what do you mean? Development control, zoning, building, all the, many of the things that are the physical side of the places we live in, and, uh, and, and I'll illustrate what I mean. This is uh, an aerial view of uh, what used to be called sprawl, uh, what could also be called auto-dependent development places. Basically, if you live, live there, uh, and uh, want to go there, it's a car trip. Everything's a car trip, and that's by design. And there's plenty of our, most of our country is zoned to deliver this as the, the easiest thing to get approved, right? This is the time to fix the rules and, and get less of that. Now, that's on the suburban end. On the city end, uh, we are working with the city of Denver, the, the District of Columbia, the city of Chicago, and others on their zoning codes to reverse things. So zoning codes and the architects suffered with this for two generations. There's a, you pull out, the, you get a commission to say, design me a building. And the first thing the architect does is pulls out the zoning code and says, how much parking do I need to provide off street? Because that's going to take up half of the lot or two thirds of the lot, whatever. And that's a minimum driven by the government. And in this case, going forward, I think we want less of this stuff. So why should the government, this is a case where I become a libertarian. Government hands off. You're asking for the wrong stuff. You're adding expense to projects. Let the developer or the project prove that they need it. Don't ask for it out of the box. And so we're turning minimums into maximums, or, or as in the case of DC, District of Columbia, eliminating altogether the idea of off-street parking minimums. Letting the developer say, I do need the spaces to sell my units, or I don't, right? If you're in a transit serve location, you could be a developer that comes in with very little. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, no parking, but very little parking. And so, and other things, uh, off-street parking, street widths, brightness, uh, uh, and other things. And here are the cities that are sort of tackling these reversals. Now, one thing that wasn't in the, in the introduction uh, that is a little biographical moment, this project, having said all the things I've said about LEED and being very committed to LEED, but finding deficiencies in approaching it one building at a time, I um, sort of, uh, well, I chaired the development of this project called LEED for Neighborhood Development, three-way joint venture between these three groups, which is the first ever sustainable rating system for communities, for master plan developments in communities. So uh, it, it exists. It takes the 10 rules of smart growth, if you've ever heard of those, and they're a mom and apple pie list of just sensible things in terms of how to invest public dollars and public funds. Uh, uh, and it also takes, so it takes the 
10 Principles of Smart Growth and the values of the new urbanism. If you haven't heard of that, it's a group that's been around about, uh, well, 18 years now, uh, and it's that big anti-sprawl group that really does focus on how you make urban places, how you make a walkable place, mixing uses, great sidewalks, street trees, uh, low-speed streets, and the like, and takes those values. And here's a, a quote from the charter of the new urbanism. Takes those two things and packages them in the lead system three-way joint venture, uh, and you can read for yourself. Um, it's organized into three parts, uh, this rating system, which is available to you and can be used to rate your neighborhood. It could be used by the city to evaluate uh, new projects. Sort of where is your project is the first question, where is it? And so part of you know Toledo's issues, Cleveland's issues, Detroit issues is as the, sometimes as the schools got Got, were perceived to be bad, people moved out, out in the edges. So the preference in Lead ND is to locate in and near existing built places. We collectively have bought that infrastructure. We own those streets, we own those sewer pipes, those telephone poles, the wires and so on. Why are we building out there where we have to buy all that stuff anew? So that, that's simply conserving uh, and avoiding sensitive lands, of course. What are you doing? Making a complete neighborhood, compact, connected, and complete. And then when you build it, make it green and high performing, right? Sort of sim simple stuff. The, what I want to introduce you to, and this is a longer document, we won't have time to go into it, but for the first time in the sustainability agenda are a lot of things that are, I'll just call them human benefits. A lot of times I think sustainability gets um, marginalized with notions in our head that it's about polar bears or an endangered species. Of, oh, yes, in the background it's about those things, but I think if we don't make it a lot more immediate, that it is about benefits in each of our own communities, that we miss a large segment of the audience. There just simply aren't that many people that can get passionate and make big decisions and life changes about polar bears. Not that I don't support it, but, so what do we have here? These are about sustainable communities, diverse mixed uses, diverse housing types, some bigger houses and some smaller houses and some coach houses and some for sale and some rental, actual affordable housing, some government or, or otherwise subsidized housing. Walkable streets is now part of sustainability. So if you're accustomed to the lead system and it's about the standalone building, this raises all the questions of what, does your building create a place? Is it part of a walkable neighborhood? Or is it that isolated thing uh, between the concrete and the asphalt? Uh, and then some really exciting ones on the bottom here, which I think are, are actually some of the most fun things that, that have come new recently to sustainability. Access to parks, we've talked about that a little bit. Local food production. You know, do you have a community garden? Do you have a farmer's market? Are you a member of a community-supported agriculture contract? Uh, and so on is now part of LEAD, right? That's pretty fun. People, people like that kind of stuff. And then outreach, and this is public involvement, going to public meetings, making sure that when you make a plan or you propose a change, that people are consulted and people shape the plan, and all inevitably the plan is better for it. So the LEAD ND system has had a pilot program. We've had 208 projects around the country, and lots of them, a number of them in Cleveland. Anybody involved in any of the LEAD ND projects here? I, if you are, I can't see you, but come find me over cocktails uh, later. So one thing to say about LEAD ND is that it's, um, it's good for people and it's good for the planet. You can see here that we did a, an assessment, the top part of the slide there says that it's relevant to climate change and greenhouse gas. And if that's an issue that interests you, it's good. It delivers good outcomes. And then on the bottom is we had the Centers for Disease Control actually review the standard line by line. And what they found was it's good for people. It's, these are good public health outcomes. That is either better health uh, 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 overall for public health or lower health costs come from places like Lead ND requires. And so the urbanism actually matters in a way, and it delivers benefits in a way that the standalone buildings, standalone green buildings cannot deliver. So it was a very exciting confirmation of what we've done. So, and I say to you, if you're, if you're in a municipal set, setting, um, most of your regulations will, will make Lead ND illegal. You'd be surprised. Uh, we do audits around the country to sort of prove this out. So fixing the rules to make sustainability legal in your town is a, a certain first step to make, make more of it happen. So the last, last point here, the last sort of prescription, live locally, advocate for living locally. So I think there's a, there's a lot of sides of this, but I think it goes back uh, to this one idea that you know, what is sustainability about? There's one, ex one sort of set of expectations that it's a Buck Rogers set of inventions, like I've said, that will somehow fix 
our technology so that we can go and still fly around everywhere and not harm the planet. There's another point of view that is that says, you know what, it's probably going to be some of that and then it's also going to be some looking back in in history to an earlier pattern of human, how we organized our lives on the planet, right? Whether it's 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But I, I submit to you that the walkable local living is absolutely going to be more of the future and, and not less. And so local living uh, is, is part of it. So we've started this thing called the Communities Cam 2030 Communities Campaign and trying to put out there the idea that that used to be the on a Ozzie and Harriet nuclear family, two adults and kids, dr by big driveway, one car per adult was the American dream. Uh, and it's gotten us a lot of material prosperity. It's also now the problem. And so we've got to rethink what we want. So submit, so uh, follow, follow along. This is inspired by this friend of mine, Ed Masria, who created something called the 2030 Architecture Challenge. And it's been adopted, I don't know if it's been adopted in Cleveland, somebody may know, by the city of Cleveland or by other organizations. But it's essentially a set of energy efficiency targets for buildings. And uh, we at Far Associates have embraced this. We're members, we are affiliates, and we've figured out how to make buildings that do wonderful things energy-wise. So from left to right, 50% better than code, 55% better than code, 71% better than code. And then, as I mentioned, our first zero net energy house, it actually produces more energy than it consumes. So we've, we love this, we've figured it out. These are off-the-shelf components and so on. So the thing that seemed when it was proposed, these sort of, uh, the 2030 challenge, I failed to mention the punchline, which is by 2030, Ed's protocol says that every building built will be a net zero building, meaning it will produce more energy that, than it consumes. And when Ann said that four or five years ago, I thought, you know, you know, I don't think there was one building in the country that did that. And now there are obviously a number, and we've actually done our first. And so this is technologically possible. It's financially within the reach of a number of people that don't, wouldn't, don't necessarily value it, but could certainly afford it. And so the ch change of thinking that comes with setting a big generational goal, I think, is what we're, what we're about here. Uh, so, but this, the second part of this is the community challenge, which is to take this on about how we live our lives, how we spread ourselves off acro across the land. So here's a chart for you. The Amer average American drives 10,000 miles a year. Every adult. And so, um, you know, that's from the North Pole down to basically Tierra del Fuego every year every year. Uh, the average American family basically drives once around the planet every year. These are Americans. And so, uh, you know, this is not, I don't think, sustainable. Um, if your fuel efficiency were slightly better, I'm not sure that that's making a big dent. Clearly, we don't like where we live because we seem to always want to be somewhere else, right? So, which is why I come back to this idea of living locally. If you lived in, you know, pick the neighborhood, you know your neighborhood's better, but like pick the best place you've ever been where you could say, wow, that's a place I could live without a car, you know? That's what I'm talking about. And, and don't, I, I will not tolerate it dug everywhere but Cleveland. No, Cleveland too. You're, you're on the hook, right? So, and here's another way of looking at the same statistics. VMT is vehicle miles traveled. Um, in 2000, we drove this many miles, 2.7 trillion miles. A light year, which is the distance light travels in a year, which is a measure of distance, not, not time, 5.8 trillion. And we're on trajectory as a country. In 2025, we Americans will drive one light year per year. So this is like driving a series of little cars driving out to the nearest star, right? I mean, these are big distances, right? Proving the point it can't be sustainable. And this is, at this part of the talk, there's often a suspension of saying like, well, this guy's smoking something. We can't, we're embedded. We can't choose, we can't change these things. It's out of our power. And I submit we need to start the conversation. Here's another way of looking at the same stuff, how much we've driven over the century. 1910, we drove 100 miles a year. 1930, 1,000. 1970, 4,000. 2000, we drove 8,100 miles. And the trajectory, even with the down economy, in 73 and 79, remember those blips? I'm from Detroit. I know it as well as, as anybody, as well as you do, that there were blips, and then we resumed driving at the same rate. And I, there's no reason to think that we will, we will not do that. Why? Because we subsidize it. We've, this is part of our culture. It's things we value. So, so one thing I would say is that as we have become this driving culture, the places we make and the buildings we design are 
are devalued, right? If you experience a city or a neighborhood or a street or even a building at 50 miles an hour or the only way you see it is across a 400 foot wide parking lot, does it really matter if it's made out of ephus that you can take and destroy with a big pen by putting it through the facade of the building? It's a disposable building for an impermanent land use, right? So makes sense. So we've cheapened our buildings because we don't, we don't care. By contrast, places where you walk, you get the most tenacious architectural approval fights. People care because it's their neighborhood, they see it every day, and the, the architecture is there for the reward of the pedestrian. So anyway, a, a major rethinking about all these things. And here's my proposal to you, a not immodest proposal. Look at that green dot laying out there, like, huh. You know, so the proposal is that by 2030, we Americans would again drive as much as we drove in 1970. Okay, so basically half. Now, who could imagine your life today driving half the miles you do? Would you still have the same quality of life you have? Maybe you don't drive at all, in which case you can raise your hand. But if you were driving half the miles, would you still like your life? Would you have to sell your house? Would you have to you know, get a different job? I and mean, what would you have to do? So it's an interesting uh, coffee table discussion or dinner table discussion. So that's the proposal. Well, guess what? Humans don't change this fast. Uh, our decisions aren't that elastic. And so this is a, it's a thinking, thinking problem. But I want, here's what I want to do is this, this is about to feel to you like you've denied me something, you've taken something from me. And I mean nothing of the sort. We're a democracy, we're a capitalist democracy. If you want to drive, you have the freedom to drive. I think we should price things accordingly and people would make different decisions. But what I want you to do here is set all that aside and do the thinking pr challenge, which is to say, how could life be better with this scenario? If I drove half, what would, I, what would be different? What trade-offs would I have and what would be the upside of all that? And so I want you to think about that. I will also say that in 1970, first of all, this is, this is the car I wanted our family to have in 1970, which is the Plymouth Barracuda. It came out in 65 and 66. So I'm not anti-car. I actually like cars and I think they've given us a great freedom. So this is not anti-car. This is not anti-choice. This is about envision the benefits that come from driving less. So I submit to you that in 1970, nobody was sitting around and going, you know what, uh, boy, life would be so much better if we only drive twice the miles we do now. You know, I, I'm really suffering in my life until I can double my VMT, right? No, that didn't happen. People had a lot of fun in cars. People were conceived in cars. I mean, cars were fun, right? So I want to put cars from a, a dependent position. We People in this audience, I know many of you, need your car for, or your life would cease to be viable, in, economically or otherwise. Um, so I'm saying move it back to where it was, was originally as a point of recreation. Remember growing up and your parents would say, come on kids, we're getting in the car and you can finish the sentence. We're going for a ride, right? No one said that since the year 2000 to anybody. We don't go for recreational rides anymore. It's all because we are dependent on the car. Wrong relationship. So, so driving, I would submit to you, is the new smoking, right? So remember the moment when smoking went from um, probably bad for you to discouraged to pariah to illegal, right? It happened in about eight years' time. Our thinking about it changed, and so this is meant to spur some rethinking about it. So, and this is this is the way I think that maybe it will happen uh, most quickly, is through changes in culture. <laughs> so the idea that somehow if you drive too much, you're just not hot. You know, I don't want to date you. You're not going to sleep. I'm not sleeping with you. You drive too much. That is culture change. So that's what we want more of. And if you buy a book tonight, special deal, you'll see this. If you buy, buy a box of books, I'll give you anything. But if you, but if you buy a, a single book, um, you get this button. <clears throat> and I don't have them with me, but I will just say if you, if you want one, I can arrange to mail some of these. This bumper sticker. And so the, this is, uh, um, as you can, <laughs> As you can see, you know, we had the downer slides in the front and the happy slides at the end. But I do think that um, revisualizing what we want and realigning our values uh, goes a long way. And my ideal is that Toledo would have many streets and many centers and downtowns uh, that look like this. Thank you. William McLaughlin, I've worked for the city of Cleveland for 34 years. 
putting orange barrels on streets, basically the street reconstruction repair. And us engineers and you architects aren't very political. Sure, you could de uh, design a very sustainable platinum lifestyle in Cleveland, but you also have to look at the biggest downfalls, the quality of the school systems and other services. Unless you get into that, you can do everything you want, perfect, but no one will buy into it due to forces beyond our control. Very good. Thank, thank you. I asked him to pose this question because he posed it in the lobby, and schools is a huge deal. Um, oh, it is a general type of question. He didn't yeah, pl yeah. plant it. Well, d d let, me, let, me, let me just say this sort of at the highest level. Um, in this country, those of you who know this, we are expecting another 100 million Americans by the year 2045. Right? That's, that's sort of done deal, right? It's just a question of where they go. And uh, that's one. Number two is we know another thing demographically and that there's a lot of empty nesters, people who don't have kids at home anymore, f whose houses are ill-suited to their lifestyle. Many of them live in the suburbs. They had big lawns for the kids, and now they don't care to mow. They don't do eaves. They don't do plowing. They don't do painting. They want the, the lower-maintenance lifestyle. So the, the empty nesters want to live in cities. So do the 20-somethings. You graduate from college, the last place you want to live if you're single is on a cul-de-sac. Why? You can't breed with anybody. There's nobody there. You can't meet them, right? So you go to a city, you put on black, and you go to bars, you get inebriated, lower your defenses, and you breed, right? And that doesn't happen on cul-de-sac. So, so the good news for Cleveland is it's got good urban bones, and the demographic bubble is coming your way. And the gentleman, your first name again? William. Um, made the crucial point, which, and mind you, the two groups I just mentioned don't have children, and they don't go to school, right? Or they don't need public schools yet. So, but it is a, an enduring issue, and there are two tracks on this. The school choice voucher thing that was championed by John Norquist when he was mayor of Milwaukee, which says, if I pay city taxes, don't make me go to the neighborhood school if it's a bad school. Give me a voucher that allows me to shop so that my kid can go to the school that's best for them. That's one model, and the other one is to do charters. And anyway, so there's, there's innovative models. I own a 90-year-old house a mile and a half from here. And what do you think of the idea that the most sustainable house is one that's already built? Sure. And in a neighborhood of 90, 100-year-old houses, if neighbors were to get together and want to become more sustainable, what would the first three things you tell them to do be? Uh, well, let's see. The, f the first one would be you know, all the sage advice about weatherization, windows, and so on. Older houses use the most energy through infiltration. So, you know, make them tighter, sealed, better windows, and so on. So that's about the house itself. Um, the second thing, the most environmental thing you could do is have more people live in the same house, right, the same square footage. Now, there's an interesting, we're in an interesting moment in time where we haven't figured out even to ask the right questions. So the lead green building systems and other green building systems measure uh, building performance per square foot. What does this mean? It means Bill Gates' new house, which is now 10 years old, 37,000 square feet, is considered more energy efficient than my 1,940 square foot four square. Why? Because it's measured per square foot. We have three people in 1,900 square feet. He has four in 37,000, but his is considered more efficient. So if you could take in a border, or, and this, this is their architectural issues and context issues that I, I, I'm not glossing over. But, um, uh, you know, the example of Rochester, New York comes to mind. I don't know if you know that story, but when Kodak and Xerox and all of the industries that really j propelled their, their economy happened, they, they, ad they um, housed that population in the same building stock. So they, it, it's what happens in a lot of places. The big mansion gets divided into apartments and suddenly it's not a one family, it's a three family or something. And now as the population has left uh, 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 Rochester, they're deconverting things. And so the ability to absorb more people and not build any buildings is the best thing. So sometimes ordinances get in the way of this. You can't rent, you can't have a second entrance, your zoning doesn't allow it, things like that. And that, to me, is environmental. The third thing I would say is get a share car. You know what a share car is? It's a, it's a, there's a couple companies now, Flex Car, 
Yeah, right, right. And to put it on your block. And the ideal in sustainable urbanism is one share car per block. Now, what is a share car? Share car is a, a car that you can reserve either on the internet uh, or with a phone call, and you can reserve it by the hour, and you pay by the hour and by the mile. And so uh, the average cost of keeping a car on, the, on a road is $8,000 a year for the purchase of it, the upkeep, insurance, gas, and so on. And you can use, if the reason your family has its third car or its second car is that on Tuesday nights, your family needs two cars, and that's the only reason you have that second car, you are burning through a lot of money. Because if you had a reliable share car that you could reserve every Tuesday night and pay $18 every Tuesday night for you know $1,300 in the year, you could take the place of $8,000 of car. And so it's a wealth creation tool. And so uh, you know, guess what you need to support a share car with a, within walking distance? Density. You need enough density. So if you ha live on one acre lots or two acre lots or five acre lots, a share car won't work. There aren't enough people that can walk to the, where that car is parked. And if you need to drive to the share car, you don't need the share car because you just drove there, right? So, so anyway, this, the layering of density on urbanism and then the integration of high performance buildings and infrastructure, you know, it's what Europe does. It's what I hope we do more of. And I think it's really good. There's profit making potential here. And I will say that if you interview the people that live in the, like the bed zeds and the dockside greens, they are delighted to be part of something bigger than themselves. You know, for some people, they get it through uh, reading books or, or religion or church or temple, uh, other people music. And these people, some of them, not, not that this has to become your hobby or you have to be passionate about it or you don't belong there, but for a lot of people, it adds value and it gives them sort of a meaning. I'm not just living a life, I'm living a life with other people who sh are on the same experimental ship I'm on a little bit. So, so that's, that's value added too.